Praise God. Amen. Amen. We started just a few minutes ago, for those of you joining us right now or those of you joining the broadcast, we started out just a few minutes ago by describing and explaining just a little bit about the beginning of the Bible. Uh, the Bible starts out in the book of Genesis, which is the word that means beginnings, uh, and, and uh, the book of beginnings. And we started out talking about the fact that everything was created. And, and it says in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, verse 1. And the earth was without form, void, darkness on the face of the Spirit of God moved in the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And saw the light, it was good, divided the light from darkness, called the light day and the darkness night, evening and morning were the first day. And God said, and you'll read that over and over throughout the first chapter of Genesis, and God said, and at the end of verse 7, and it was so. In verse 9, and God said, and at the end of that verse, it was so. In verse 11, and God said, and at the end of the verse, it was so. In verse 14, and verse 20, and verse 24, and verse 26, and verse 29, and then that chapter ends by, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Evening and morning were the sixth day. And then thus were the heavens and the earth finished in chapter 2, and on the seventh day he rested. And then it talks about man. And it says in verse 7, he formed man out of the dust of the ground, out of the ground. And we're told that today, that our physical bodies are made up from the mineral components of soil and of clay and of dirt. And so he, he made man from, from the actual dust of the ground, from the world, from the earth that he'd created. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul, an eternal soul. That's the thing that makes you different from animals, different from birds, different from reptiles. You see animals out in the field and, the, and where the deer and the antelope play and, and where the buffalo roam and, and where the giraffes try to walk and, and, and your dogs and your cats. And, and, and they, they, you, people come to me and they'll say, well, they have a soul. You know, if that's your personality, uh, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I don't know if fish have a soul, but, but, but uh, they just kind of do circles around the tank trying to stay out of the way of the big ones. Uh, but uh, but, but, uh, but we, have, we have pets. We have two little dogs. They definitely have different personalities. Uh, see, but the thing that they lack is, is a spirit. Adam became a spirit man, a living soul, a soul with eternity, eternity in it, eternity into it. And, and, you know, people say errantly sometimes, well, everyone when they die, I'll go up or down. Well, that's not errant. That's the truth. Heaven or hell. And, and, and uh, you know, some will go on into eternal life. No, all will go into eternal life. Yeah, all will go into eternity. Every, every one, one destination or the other, either in God's presence or banished from God's presence. Not because of what you've done. Not because of something you haven't done. Might, might very well be because of something that, that you haven't done. And that's accept the gift that God gave, and that was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't go to hell because of what you've done. No, 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 he paid for what was done. Well, you, I have to suffer for that. No, 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 he suffered for that. He suffered for that. No, no, the thing that keeps anyone out of God's presence for eternity, we call it heaven, uh, but actually... Uh, and I'm not going to teach you on that right now. Uh, the thing that we call heaven is a heavenly city called the New Jerusalem. Uh, but, but, but to be in God's presence and in God's service and in God's will for all of eternity, you have to accept God's gift. Amen. God's gift gets you into his presence for eternity. His gift is his only begotten son. For God so loved the world, he gave. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him would never perish but, but have, have everlasting life. Uh, and and I, I was I was very very much encouraged. I had conversation with with one of my Christian brothers that goes to a different church, part of a whole different religious culture, different different denomination. He came to my office this week, and we met and we talked, uh, and, and and he started talking about some of our differences. Uh, and then he said, but the, but the great thing, Pastor, is that we have the most important thing in common, and that's that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, the only Savior, that Jesus Christ 
Christ is the one our faith must be in. We have to accept and receive him. Uh, and, and I reached across my desk and shook his hand. I said, you're exactly right. We agree on, we agree on what's important. See, I heard some, uh, we were at a pastor's uh, uh, fellowship one day, and, and people, they, we started talking about the majors and the minors, majoring on the, minor, ma- majoring on the majors uh, and leaving the minor things alone. And somebody said, well, what's the majors? What, what's the major thing that's majorly important uh, in, in regard to our faith? And he said, I look at it this way. If you, if you go to visit someone in the hospital and the doctor comes out, looks at you and says, we're glad you're here because they have one minute to live. One minute. Right now, 55 seconds. And you dash through the door and you hear him say, 50 seconds. What are you going to talk about? What are you going to share with him in the last 45 seconds of his existence in life? To See, that's the majors. That's the majors. It's not going to be, do you use unleavened bread or, or Ritz crackers or saltine crackers in communion? What, what, what's, what's the configuration of the chairs in your sanctuary? Do you have red carpet, purple carpet, beige carpet, green carpet? Do you have any carpet? Do you have drums in your sanctuary? Because we know that's demonic. You, you know, you're not going to talk about you're not going to You're not going to discuss the non-important, non-essential things. Now you're down to 25 seconds. What are you going to talk about? You're going to talk to him about Jesus Christ and him crucified and is your faith in him? Have you accepted what he did for you on that cross on Calvary that day uh, and, and get him into heaven? Amen. Get him into heaven. Uh, and, and I just encourage you when you talk with people and you have an opportunity to share your faith, stay on the majors. Come on. Yeah, stay on the things of major importance because there, there are all kinds of controversial things that people want to discuss. That really means argue about argue about okay so 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 stay on those things okay all right did adam have a belly button i don't know and what's the difference really you know what's the difference since god created him and he wasn't born we don't know some of you are thinking did adam have a belly button all right so you might have your opinion there might be flip a coin get to heaven you can go all right Second chapter, he created man, breathed into man, and he became a living soul. Verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, in Eden. And there he put the man that he had formed. And so this was something that God did. This will be, this will be representative of Eden, Eden being a region, a region uh, and, and in studying this, uh, what I continually came across was that most believe that it was the size of a small country, the size of a small country, somewhere in the neighborhood of the size of Texas or, 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 or Alaska. Uh, Jewish culture and the Talmud says it was about 7,100 square miles, 7,100 square miles, a region of the earth. Uh, and, they, and they believe they can pinpoint where that region was. Uh, no archaeological uh, dig or, or, or expedition has ever discovered Eden, ever. And most believe that the, Noatic, the Noah's flood, the Noatic flood, uh, actually wiped out uh, any evidence of its exact location uh, and even some of, the, some of the geographic things that were told about it. But we're told in, what we are told is that in Eden, in this region of the earth called Eden, God planted a garden. Let me ask you a question. Who planted it? God planted it. God planted a garden, and that's where he put the man. So he planted a garden, and then he deposited his man into that garden. God did that, right? Okay, so God did that. We've got that clear. Then out of the ground the the Lord God made to grow every tree... Pleasant for sight, good for food. The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we're going to take Eden away here. We're going to take Eden out of this. And we're just going to focus down on the garden. And this is the garden east of Eden. And, and, and whatever this garden looked like, whatever I, I don't know what the shape of the garden was or, or if it was perfectly round or perfectly square or, 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 or what, but... Every single time that you read this in your Bible, I hope you notice this. I hope you notice that absolutely at the dead center 
If it was a bullseye, it would be the little X in the circle ring of the interior circle. Your Bible says he put the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. Not in the east side, not over on the right, not on the north half. It says he put that right at the very center of the Garden of Eden. Everything in Eden was built out around the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything. It was in the middle of the garden, dead center. Everything else revolved around it. The tree of life in the middle, in the midst of that garden, right in the middle. And a river went out of Eden. Now remember, Eden is out here. Eden is this whole region, and a river went out of Eden. And, and the river flowed into Eden and watered Eden, and watered Eden. And from there, it parted and became four major rivers. So it was a large river. And it flowed out of Eden into the garden. And there it parted and became four heads. And there is a lot of speculation on what rivers they are. Two of them are named the Tigris and the Euphrates. They both flow through the Middle East. And then two are named that, that we don't even see the names of any longer after Noah's flood again. Those two rivers either either uh, ceased to exist by that name uh, or, or were reconfigured uh, there. But, but we don't even know where the other two are. But out of the garden, once they came out of the garden then, when they came out of the garden, uh, they flowed into four different rivers and were given the names of those four major rivers that are flowing out of there, that are flowing out of there. Okay. Then it talks about the gold and the bed and, and the bedelium and, and the onyx stone in verse 12, uh, part of <clears throat> where it goes to. And, and, and the rivers are named, and the last river is the Euphrates in verse 14. And then in verse 15, and, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. Second time we read that, it was the Lord's garden. He made it, he planted it, he erected it, he constructed it, and then he put the man in it. He did that. He did that. To do what? Then he gave him a job. Then he gave him a job. We call that a ministry. We call that an opportunity to serve. He didn't just put him in the Garden of Eden to kick back and enjoy the scenery. He expected him to work there. Thank you for your enthusiasm about that. <laughs> to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded. Oh, pastor, are we going to put the Ten Commandments? This is the first commandment right here. This isn't the, this, the, Moses got some commandments, but he came down with the entire law, which was 632 commandments, rules, regulations, ordinances. He came down. We, we've, we've got ten of them. The Lord separated out ten of them uh, and said, here, keep these. And no one has ever has been able to, ever except the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else has ever kept them. They weren't designed to show you that you couldn't do it without God's help. But here, this is the very first command that the Lord gives to human humanity in the Bible. He says, of every tree in the garden you may eat. Now, wait, 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 wait. He's talking like this is his garden. God's talking like he's in charge. He's talking like he's the boss or something. I mean, once he put Adam in there, didn't that become Adam's garden? Couldn't he do what he wanted? Couldn't he eat what he wanted? And couldn't he? No, no, no. He could do a lot of what he wanted. And this is what trips people up. This is what trips Christians up. It's what trips church people up. It's what, it's what trips a lot of believers up. Because God gives Adam a job and says, dress it and keep it. And then he doesn't give him any instruction on how. I'll go, okay, today's pruning day. We're going we're gonna to prune. Well, are we going to prune the bottom limbs up to two feet or two and a half feet? Are we going to prune the limbs three feet or four feet? Are we just going to prune them on one side today and the other side tomorrow? Are we going to prune them on all four sides? Are we going to cut your grass? Ever, ever, anybody cut your grass? And they come in and they say, how high do you want your grass? You want it five inches, four and a half inches, four inches, three and a half inches, three inches? I don't care. Just cut the grass. I'm not going to tell you how long to cut my grass. Why would I tell you that? Well, because if you cut the grass at three inches, then your roots will only get on three inches. Well, I learned something today. Why don't you cut them at three and one quarter point five inches for me? 
No, I just let him do it. God put him in this garden. God put Adam in that garden, and, and he gave him a job, and he said, dress and keep the garden. Now, if, if the Jewish estimates are right, and, and, and we can say this is 12 miles from here to here, and, 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 and from here to here is 10 miles, and, and that's about 120 square miles, and that's just Jewish tradition, but, but it's right in the Talmud that they, that they believe that, and we can calculate it down, 120 square miles. Adam had a lot of territory where he could do what he wanted. And he said he put him in the garden and told him to dress it and keep it. And then, and then verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name given. And he gave names to all the cattle, fowls of the air, beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper. And so God gave him, God gave Adam a job, a, a ministry. God gave Adam a ministry and said, cultivate the garden, prune the garden, dress the garden, keep the garden. You be the garden keeper, farm the garden, harvest the garden. You take care of the garden. And then he said, I'm going to bring every animal, every domesticated animal, every wild animal, every bird, every living thing I'm going to bring to you, and you're going to name it. Gave him no, no guidance whatsoever. Called the dumb thing a hippopotamus. <laughs> hippopotamus. A raccoon. Coyote, a squirrel. You've never thought about those names. You, you, you've never thought about a zebra. Well, that's an English word for this white. And, no, that's not an English word. A zebra, a walrus, a muskox, a donkey, huh? a pig. That was all up to Adam did exactly what he wanted, did exactly what he pleased, here and 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 everywhere out here, this was, this was Adam. And, and he did as he pleased, and he, do, he did as he saw fit everywhere in the garden, except right here. <laughs> except right in the very heart of the garden, right in the very middle of the garden, right at the very center of the garden, God said, but that's my tree. That's mine, and you don't touch it. That's, well, why leave it to, why don't you leave that up to God? Because God always, when any being has a free will, you have to have the ability to exercise it. Or it's not free. Or it's not free. God gave Adam and God gave every other human being that, that powerful, powerful freedom of choice. The ability to choose, to make choices, to freely decide, to not be a robot. And with that free will, which is part of the nature and the image of God, God created man in his own image, his own likeness, and, and, and in the image of God created he them. Created he him, male and female, he created he them. And, and so he gave him the ability to choose names for plants and bushes and shrubs and trees and, and, and vegetation and, and, and vines and, and things that crawl and things that creep and things that run and things that jump. A kangaroo? Yeah. Yeah. A what? A kangaroo and a dung pile ant. Well, all right. Huh? And he and, and, and he was he was in charge. And he was in control. But God commanded of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat. Now here's that free will. For the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. 
Now, even though God forbade it, it was still possible. There was still potential. He could reach out and take it if he wanted to. God put that right there. And God said, that's all yours. That, you, do, you do what you want out there. In, in essence, Adam is in charge everywhere else in life except right here, except right there. Adam's in charge everywhere else in life except that one place that God says, but that's mine. And that's where God's in charge. And that's where God's will is done. And that's where God's desire takes place. And that's where what God says goes. And 120 square miles and one tree. 120 square miles. You can do anything you want. I don't know how many trees. I don't know how many trees are in an acre. I don't know how many acres are in a square mile. I don't know how many trees are in 120 square miles. But you can, you can climb whichever ones you want. You can prune whichever ones you want. You, you can eat off whichever ones you want. You can do anything you want. You can name them. But you can't eat off that one. That one's mine. And what fouls most humans up? They don't look at their own life and take care of their own life. They violate what's God's. They violate what's God's. And in your life and in my life, in most of your life, almost every single area of your life, you're in charge. All right, let's start. <laughs> what time did you get up this morning? Whose decision was that? Did you get up because you set your, your watch? Oh, yeah, by the way, who bought that watch? You know, that's an I watch. That, that's a me watch. That's an us watch. That's a <laughs> yellow. By, what color is it? Is it gold? Is it silver? Is it white gold? Is it yellow? Is the face black? Is it red? Has it got big hands? Is it digital? Does it light up or not? And we're not even past the watch yet that got you out of bed. Maybe it wasn't a watch. Maybe it was a alarm clock. Was it battery or was it plug-in? What time was it set to and who set that time? See, so you're not even out of bed yet. Oh, bed. Let's see. Is it twin? Is it full? Is it queen? Is it king? What kind of sheets do you have? Do you have blankets on it? Do you have a comforter? Is it a down comforter, polyester comforter? How many pillows are on your bed? We're not even out of bed yet. We're not even out of bed yet, and we're talking about how many things that you decide that you're in charge of, that you're in control of, and it's perfectly fine with God. He doesn't care. You're not even out of bed yet in the morning. When it does go off, who's in charge of whether you hit the snooze, how long the snooze, whether you, whether you actually shut it off, whether you go back to sleep? I know somebody who shut her alarm off this morning and then went back to sleep. I won't tell you who, but... I just know somebody, that's all. <laughs> now, I'm not going to get into what you sleep in, but that's your determination, that's your decision. But, but what, 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 your sheets, you like them long, you like them short. Your pillowcases, I don't have cases on my, okay, okay, whether or not you have pillowcases. The ones with the nice little stitchy things around there, and little pictures on them, little designs on there. What color are they? Are they blue, are they green, are they aqua, are they, are they gold, are they silver, are they white? Are they black? Are they silk? Are they cotton? Who decides all of that? What about your mattress? You like one of the firm ones? One of the, we haven't even got it out of bed yet. Your firm ones or your squishy ones? A water bed. <laughs> a surf, you know, what kind of bed? Okay, got a heater on it? Got a, got a blanket on it? Maybe you got one of those because you can't, you sleep with somebody and, and they like it cold and you like it hot, so you get a dual controlled. And we got solutions for everything. You like yours up, <laughs> control bed. Nine, ten, firm, soft. You, you can do everything with your bed. You got a headboard? You don't have to have a headboard, but you could have a steel one. You could have a, you could have a wrought iron one. You have a black one. You have a gold one. You, you, have, a, you have a big old, big old oak one. You, you don't have to have a headboard. You have a footboard. How high? Some beds, I mean, now they're like this high. You need a ladder to get into them. <laughs> Serious. You ever seen one of those? We went to a place one time. It's like a ladder to get up in bed. What if I fall out? hurt myself, sign an insurance waiver before you come stay here. Okay, you're not even out of bed yet. 
And they've already given you 30 different decisions that are all yours about what time did you go to bed? Now you leave a light on, you leave a night light on, leave a fan on, leave some noise, white noise, uh, have music playing. You're not even out of bed yet, and we've given you 40 different things that you get to decide. That's all out here. That's, that's your whole life. Your whole life. All right, let's, let, let's, let's just decide. What, what time's a good time to get up on Sunday morning? And don't tell me 1130. Okay. Five what? 530. 530. Do I hear 6 o'clock? Do I hear 6? See? See? But who did that? Did God do that? Did he, did he write in his word? Did he come down, visit you? Did he send an angel? Thus saith the Lord, 5.52 a.m. on Sunday morning. No, he didn't do that. He left that up to you. He left that up to you. And once it does go off, he leaves that up to you. And which side of the bed you get up on, that's totally up to you. And which, which, north, south, east, or west, I hope your room's got four, you know, walls in there. And they might lay southeast, southwest. It, it's up to you where you arrange it, right? You have a dresser in there. You have a desk in there. You have a chair in there. You have a little, little couch or love seat in there. You got, you got a TV in there. That's all up to you. Everything is up to you. Everything in your life is up to you until you come to this one little centralized area in your life that God doesn't leave up to you and expects you to do exactly what he says in that particular area and arena of life. And it may look at times like, oh man, we go to church and pastor tells us everything we can't do and shouldn't do. And say, It's such a small, minuscule, really, truthfully, one tree in all of 120 square miles of trees and bushes and shrubs and plants and flowers. And, 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 and there's one, one little area, but it's right in the middle. But it's right in the very center. Everything else has to revolve around it, and every time you want to go to that, you have to go back to the middle. You have to go to the heart of the matter. You have to go to the heart of the matter. Now, when it comes to what's his, when it comes to what's God's, as opposed to, did we get you out of bed yet? Oh, yeah, whichever side is right side, wrong side. Uh, you want to be barefoot? You don't have to be barefoot. You can have your little slippers right there. You can put booties on. You can put socks on. Or you can just go barefoot if you like. But that's totally up to you. If you do wear slippers, they can be lined. Oh, they can have nice little felt liners in it, a little, 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 little cushy. You know, they can have sponge soles on there. You would get bored if I took you through even one day of your whole life and all the decisions and determinations you get to make. Those are nice fingernails, Paula. Did you paint those? You decided not to paint them. Uh, did somebody else paint them? Who picked out the color? I bet you every person here who's got painted nails, fingers or toes, uh, they, 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 they pick their own color. God didn't pick that color for them. Hmm? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's nice jewelry you have on there, Paula. Who picked that? I better have you. Who bought that? <laughs> See, God didn't come down and, and, and give you what you're, what you're to wear, put your makeup on for you, pick your clothes out for you. You get everything in your life you purchased, you bought. You liked the Bible, and so you bought it. You liked the message, so you got the CD or the DVD of it. You want to go to, to a, 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 a movie. You want to take a trip. You want to go on vacation. You want to go to a restaurant. Which restaurant? You're going to eat when you leave here? Where are you going to go? Whose decision is that? You're going to walk in, and, 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 and they're going to give you a menu. It's going to have 19 pages, both sides. And they're going to say, what can I get you? And you're going to say, well, I'm going to pray, and the Lord's going to tell me what to eat. Uh-uh, you're going to be awful hungry by the time that day. He leaves that up to you. Leaves that up to you. And what you live in and what you drive and, and, and it just just how you drive, how fast you drive, how slow you drive, which direction you drive, what route you take. Your whole life, you're making the decisions and the determinations on. And that's all the rest of the garden except for that part right there. And that's what God gives commandment about. Commandment. Now, in the New Testament... We have, well, let's just, let's, just, let's just leave Eden for just a moment or two. Let's just leave Eden for just a, just a, just a, brief, uh, a brief moment. 
Did you learn anything about Eden today? Yeah. Okay, but is it going to help you? Well, I don't know. That depends on the rest of the service, the next 15 minutes. Okay, let's turn over to Matthew. Let's turn over to Matthew. Matthew. Now, now let me ask you one thing. In, in, in the entire Old Testament, in the entire from Genesis chapter 2 on, from Genesis chapter 2 on, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, all the way through, Minor Prophets, Major Prophets, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, all the way up through. What else did God build? What else did God build? Pardon? What else did God build in the whole Old Testament? What else did he build? What else did he construct? What else did he erect? I know he didn't erect the Tower of Babel. I know he didn't make the Ark of the Covenant. He gave them instruction. They built it. He told them how. He didn't, they didn't build the tabernacle. God didn't do that. He gave, he gave Moses the plan, and, and he anointed people to, to do the job, and they went and did it. What else did God build? What else did God build from Genesis 2 on? What did he build? What did God build? He built a garden. Built a world, and then he, there was some region of the earth called Eden, and, he, and he, he planted that garden there. He's the one. He put everything there. All the animals, all the plants, everything. Bushes, shrubs, flowers, everything. He put there. He did that. Man did not do that. He did that. He said, I will build my garden. And he, he built his garden just exactly the way he wanted to. And he put man there and said, now I want you to take care of it. What else did he build? Old Testament. Genesis 2, 1. Okay. Matthew 16. The 18th verse. The Lord Jesus tells you what he's building in the New Testament. The New Testament. The New Testament. The New Covenant. Matthew 16, 18, he's answering Peter and says that your name will be Peter, and on this rock, uh, and that's the, 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 the bedrock of the New Testament, is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is God's Son, and he is Lord. And he says that's the foundation that, and then he says these five words right here. Then he says these five words. I will build my church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I noticed what he didn't say was, and hell won't be active in it. Or hell won't try to penetrate it. Because the last thing that God built, hell came into. Hell penetrated. And hell tempted the humans that were there to violate the part that was God's instead of just being satisfied with what was theirs. That's what happened in the last thing that he built. But I'll just go ahead and ask the question again. What else in the entire new covenant is Jesus building? And if you have an answer, give me a verse. He's not building up believers. He's got five gifts doing that. He didn't say, I will build a family. You'll never find a verse for that. He didn't say, I will build the marriage, as important as marriage and family is to him. He didn't say, I'll build business and e-commerce. I'll build the internet. No, we've got, what's his name to thank for that? Any other verses? Jesus is building his church. And it is nothing short of amazing to me to go back and look at the garden that was planted in the east part of Eden that was God's creation, and see the similarities to the church. You want to go through them for a minute with me? 
All right. Let's 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 just go through and let's just go through and look because because I'd I'd, I'd get the question, and I'd say, uh, Are you really likening the church to Eden's garden, the garden that God planted in Eden? Are you really likening the church to that? Well, let's. Um, Let's just go ahead and, 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 and look at these few similarities first. First of all, what, 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 what can we say about, about that, that garden east of Eden, uh, that God created it? I said that God created it, that he planted it, that, 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 that it's his. Did man create the garden? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, God created it. It's his. Can we say that about the church? I said, can we say that about the church? Okay. Uh, did he put man into it or did man go into it himself? The Bible says he sets us into his body as it pleases him. Um, you might find this interesting. I certainly did. I, I did this through the same study tools that I, that I shared with you a week or a week and a half ago. Uh, about studying the Bible with the Strong's Concordance and Jacinius's uh, lexicon of Hebrew words. The word garden is first used in the second chapter of the book of Genesis in your Bible. The word garden in Genesis chapter 2 is defined in the Hebrew as, as this word right here. The sanctuary. It's the sanctuary. The definition is the sanctuary, and there was a place in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, northern part of the temple, that was called Eden. It was the place where the water flowed out and watered the rest of the city. The northern part of the temple in Jerusalem they called Eden. The original temple. The definition of the word is the sanctuary. Number three, it's where this ministry was first instituted the helps ministry. He said, I'll make you a helper suitable for companionship. Amen. The helps ministry, which 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says he set in the church, was first set into the Garden of Eden. There are things that happened there that still happen here. How about this one? It was the place of the first wedding, and we still do them in the church. We still do them in the church. Over in chapter 3, over in chapter 3, when we read about Adam and Eve and after they've eaten off of the tree, it says in verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking through the garden. It's still the place where we go to hear the word of God. Still the place we go to hear the voice of the Lord. Next, next, the presence of God is there. It says, and they hid themselves from the presence of God. And number seven, sin kept them from going there to meet with God. And sin will still keep people out of church where we go to be in the presence of God and to meet with God. It's the place that he built. It's the place that he set Adam into. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. And, 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 and here's one thing that, that, that I see that, that, that so stands out to me about God coming down to meet with them. 
He came down in the cool of the day. And he came walking through the garden, and they heard the voice of the garden. They heard the voice of the Lord in the garden. And he said, Adam, where are you? You know what that tells me? He expected him to be there. And when he came down to walk through and they weren't there, he wondered where they were. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that's right, Pastor. I just remembered that. That, uh, that, that over in the book of Revelation, that over in the book of Revelation, we were going all the way to the other end. Revelation chapters 1 Revelation chapter 1, it says that, that John, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he's praying and he heard a great voice in verse 10. He heard a great voice. He said, I'm the, verse 11, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the, how many churches? Seven churches of Asia. And then he names them all. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and, 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 and Laodicea. And, and so, so, there's these, there's these seven golden pillars, and, and, and on each of them, there, there, there's this lamp of fire and, and, and light, and, and there's these seven churches, and, and, and I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and, 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 and I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, this would be looking from the top, but they were pillars of gold, and, and wow, verse 13, right in the middle, right in the midst, right there. Right in the very midst of all these different local churches, right dead center in the heart of them, there stands the Son of God. There stands the Son of God, right in the middle of everything. Right in the middle of what he's building in the New Covenant and in the New Testament. Right in the very dead center of it is the source of everlasting life, the tree of life. The tree of life, right there in the center of all of it, he's right there. And then he describes him, and, 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 and he wrote, he, he had written letters to be read to all of these different churches. If you go back to the, the fourth chapter of, of the book of Colossians, right at the very end, a lot of people miss it, just kind of read through it, read over it, but right at the end of Colossians chapter 4, it says in verse 16, when the epistle is read, when this epistle is read among you, Cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. See, see, see the, Lord's, the Lord's writing letters, and one was Colossae, and one was Ephesus, and one was, one was uh, Philippians, and one was uh, the, the first letter to the Thess Thessalonians, second, second and, and if you look at a map, you'll find out Colossae and Laodicea are right next door to each other. They're about 20 miles apart. They're about from, maybe from here to Sparta. And he said, you take the letter, that would be the book of Colossians, four chapters, you take that and you have it, you read it, and then you send it over to that church and, and, and have it read over there too. And then that letter to Laodicea, you, you get their letter and you have it read here. I'd just like to be in Colossae in church that day. And they get up and they read that lukewarm, repent, you sinners, and, and get zealous. I stand at the door and knock. I say, when, when on earth did, did the Bible say, I stand at the door of your heart and knock? Where does it say that? It doesn't say that at all. That's an addition to the Bible. It's in a song. It's in a picture. The Lord's knocking on the door of your heart. Nonsense. He was knocking on the door of the church. He's knocking on the door of the church. He's trying to get back into the church. He's not talking about some person's heart. He's on the outside. They're lukewarm. He's trying to get back in. He's standing at the church door knocking. He's not, he's not talking to a human. He's talking to a church, the seven letters of the seven churches. And he expects those letters to be written, you know, to be read. And he says, stand up and read it and take these letters. And, and all through chapter 2 and chapter 3, the letters to the churches, he says things like, like, like some of you have been thrown in prison and some of you have, have resisted this sin and some of you have repented and some of you and some of you. He expects the whole congregation to hear these. He expects them to be there. Just like when he came down into the garden, he expected them to be there. And when they weren't there, he knew something was wrong. Hey, hey, where, where are you? 
Jesus doesn't look at, the, look, look at the attendance roll. Jesus, it says, comes down and walks through the midst of the churches. That's what your Bible says. That's what Revelation chapter 2 says. In verse 1, it says, these are the things. This is he that holds the seven stars in the right hand who walks in the midst of the churches, who just walks in the middle of it, just like he walked in the midst of the garden. Just like he came down, for what reason? To fellowship with them and commune with them. And that church at Laodicea, he said, I'm standing at the door knocking. If any man open the door, it don't have to be a deacon. It doesn't have to be a greeter. If anyone will just open the door, I'll come in. This is what he said. I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. I'll sup with you. I'll fellowship with you. I'll commune with you. That's exactly what he wanted to do back there in that garden with Adam. Just exactly what he wanted to do. And he says exactly the same thing to New Testament churches. He said, this is where I want to come. And I want to, he said, where two or more of you are gathered in my name. That's what he said. I'll be there right there in your midst. And he comes and there's two gathered. And he says, well, where's the rest? See, Jesus asked that question. Remember the 10 people who were healed? And, and nine of them just went on their merry way. And one of them came back and fell down and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he said, where's the other nine? He wants to know where they're at. Why haven't they come back to say thank you? Why haven't they? And Jesus came in that day and, 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 and walked through the garden, and they heard the voice of the Lord. He is the word of God. They heard him walking through the garden, and they hid themselves from the presence of God because they'd sinned, because they'd sinned. Now, in the Old Testament, it was expected that they'd be in his house. The head of every house would go. The head of every house would go, be responsible to go. I read, I read in Hebrews 10, 25, in our covenant, it says, don't, don't stop, don't, don't, don't not fellowship together, don't not come together, don't forsake assembling together as the habit of so many has, has, has been. I read in Zechariah 14, in the millennium, in the millennial reign of Christ, even when there is no devil, even when there is no devil, he's in the bottomless pit, there are no demons, there is no temptation. In the book of Zechariah, in the 14th chapter, it says, it says there'll be people that won't come to church. That's what it says. And it shall be, verse 17, Zechariah 14, 17, and it shall be, now verse 13, 16 says, they'll come up, they'll come up and worship the Lord of hosts. They'll worship the king. They'll keep the feast of tabernacles, and it shall be that those who do not come <coughs> in all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even on them shall be no rain. Huh, I think he expects us to be here. Yeah. I think he expects us to right there in the millennium. In the millennium. If you don't come to church, no rain. I mean, he comes down, he walks through the midst of the churches. That's what he does. And it says in one of the other letters, he walks through the midst of the church, searching the reins of the hearts. He said, that's what I do. That's what I do. Never in your Bible will you read, he walks in the midst of the subdivisions. Never will you read in your Bible, he walks in the midst of the neighborhoods. Never will you read anywhere in your Bible, he walks in the midst of the Midwestern states or the Christian nations or the nations of the Southern Hemisphere. You'll never read that in your Bible. What you'll read in your Bible is he walks through what he's building. What he said he would build, he's walking in the midst of, he's searching the reins of the heart, and he expects those people to be there to listen to the letters that are read. And he expects to be the one whose commandments are obeyed there even in the millennium when they don't come to his house no rain no rain no rain you mean like my neighbor would get yes that's what I, that's what i mean like here's the here's the lot line rain no rain and there's the lot line rain and here's a lot line rain and here's a lot line rain and your hard-hearted neighbor that didn't go to worship the king no rain for a year. Wonder if they make church next year. See, that's the feast. That's a one-year feast. That, that's, that's not just every Sunday. And God didn't come down in, in Eden once a week on Sunday morning. God came down every day. And he came down to fellowship with them and commune with them and walk with them and walk with them and talk with them and talk with them. And then if that wasn't enough, and then if that wasn't enough, in the book of Luke, we've got the Great Supper where Jesus prepares this meal. And they say, oh, got to work today. Oh, I got these five yoke of oxen. Oh, we, we got to go. We, there's an open house. At, oh, we, we bought this piece of land. We have to go see it. Oh, oh, we got family and we, we got just engagements. I mean, we got, you know, I'm sure the Lord understands. 
Read your Bible. Possessions, positions, and, and relationships. The Great Supper. And the Lord of the house was angry. And the Lord of the house was angry and said, go find, go to the highways and byways and bring those people in. The people who were first invited, they're, they're not going to taste my supper. That's what the Lord said. That's what the Lord said. The pastor didn't say that. The Lord said that. The pastor didn't write seven letters to seven churches and expect they would be read and expect everybody there to hear. The Lord said that. That's what the Lord said. And so, so we have here, we have, we have the Lord's house. We have whose house? The Lord's house? Yeah, we have the Lord's house. And the Lord's house isn't, it's not Mark's house. It's not Bill and Ann's house. It's, 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 not, it's not Tony and Julie's house. Uh, it's not Kevin and Patty's house. Uh, it's not, you know, S S Sally and Sam's house. It's the Lord's house. It's the Lord's house. And if the Lord wants to say, what happens in his house and what doesn't happen in his house. And if the people who are there don't like that, if they're not careful, they'll get, they'll, 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 they'll get into, they'll get into that part that's his. Even though the vast majority of everything else in their life, they make the decisions on, they'll get upset about his house. Now I've never, I've, I've, I've never, I've never, now maybe you have, maybe you have, but I've never, I've never had anybody come into my house and just not like the way the furniture is set up and so just go about to rearrange it themselves. <laughs> now maybe you do that, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't know, but, but I would guess that even if you rent or lease, I mean, you, you pay your rent, pay your, you know, pay, pay your, it's your house, at least till the 31st, right? And, and I, I would venture to say that if somebody came into your house and just started rearranging, said, oh, we don't like the bedroom there, we want the living room there, and just started moving stuff around, I imagine you'd have a word or two to say about it. Amen. Wouldn't you? Yes. Wouldn't you? Yes. And... And, 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 you know, if, if, if people get invited over to, to, to our house and we have a meal there, um, I, I, I don't know if it's ever happened, but I know when we get invited over to somebody's house, Paula, you know, and they serve food, we don't just stick our nose up in the air and say, we don't like what they're serving, we're just going to bring our own. We don't do that. And, and, and uh, uh, I, 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 I was in a, in a place just not too long ago, and they were playing music, and it was not my favorite song. <laughs> it just wasn't my favorite song. But I didn't write up an email of protest. I don't like that song. Well, they probably would have emailed me back properly and said, we don't care. <laughs> Pro probably. You know, we've got a saying around here. We've just got a saying around here. It goes like this. When you make axe heads float. See, I made a mistake. That's the only one I've ever made. But uh, I made a mistake not too long ago here. We were at this antique shop, and they had a whole box full of old axe heads. And when I go back there, I'm going to buy one. Because I almost bought one. I had it in my hand. I had it. I, nah, and then I just put it back. I'm, I'm just going to get it. I'm just going to get it because I say that, and I'm just waiting for the day somebody says, I want to give it a try. We're going to get out a five-gallon bucket of water, and we're just going to take that axe head and just go, plunk, and say, make it float. Go ahead. You don't know what an axe head is? Some of you are looking at me like, a what? Is that like a weed whacker? Yeah, kind of like the old-fashioned type. <laughs> kind of like a chainsaw, no chain, you know. No, the Bible says the Lord made the axe head float. And when you can make axe heads float, and when you can make oceans stand up so a million people can walk through on dry ground, and when you can make it rain heaven, rain bread out of heaven, and, and have water come, we'll just get a rock and set it up. When you get water coming out of that rock, 
when you can walk through the fire not even smell like smoke and when when we when you die and we bury you and then three days later you come out of the grave and said conquered death and conquered the grave when you can do that you can head the church but until that our trust is going to be in the one who did all of that and so 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 much more for us jesus is the head of the church He's the central figure. He's the tree of life. He's the knowledge of what's good and what's evil, what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable, and what's not acceptable. Amen. Now, very early in this year, and, and it reminded me so much of 2003. In 2003, our church had some significant upheaval. Part of it was we bought a building. You're sitting in it. You're sitting in it. Uh, that's the most stressful time any church goes through, either to build or to buy and renovate or to add on to a church. I fasted the first 15 days of 2003 at the Lord's direction. I didn't know that on the next day my older brother would die. And I'd, I'd, I'd do his funeral. I'd bury him. I'd take care of my parents through that. I didn't know that the vice president of our church board and, and, and his family and, and some others would leave our church on not good terms and in not the right way and cause a significant fissure and fracture in our church congregation. I certainly didn't know on the 29th of June that I would notice an ad in the paper as I was driving across the plains to take my family on vacation that there was a building for sale and, and, and get us into this. But what the Lord spoke to me earlier this year reminded me of that and, and, and reminded me that toward the end of this year that I'd have to that I'd have to address this subject and that he'd help me do it and I've been waiting ever since for the Lord to so so ever so sweetly just remind me that this isn't my house and this isn't your house this is his house and every time we forget that this is his house and start to treat it like our house, we take something holy and sanctified. Now, that's, that's, the other, that's the other Hebrew definition for the word Eden is separated. See, he separated part of Eden out and, and planted a garden. that separated out. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. This is just one local church. It's not the church. But you know what maybe I don't like the fact that we took beams out here okay maybe I thought it was unnecessary uh, I kind of did I spent 14 years preaching up here around them must have got kind of attached to them because <laughs> I miss them <laughs> no I, I really I don't I really don't I really don't care I, I really don't I mean, the day they came in to knock them down, I didn't walk up and say, you know, give me a hug. <laughs> Come on. It's just beans. And then they came up and said, can we rearrange the chairs? I don't care. We won't have to crank our neck. I guess I never thought about that. I sit in the front row. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I don't care if they put some plasticized cave around the drums okay makes no sense to me have a percussion instrument and then make it so you can't hear it just so you can amplify it with microphones <laughs> and spend how many hundreds of dollars on those microphones this week maybe I don't even think we should have put a 5,000 square foot addition on this building but what is it to me I don't run the church it's not my church he said he'd build his church. He's building it. He sets everyone in it that he wants in it. 
He calls who he wants and doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. Call, calls the weak and the ungifted so he can pour himself into them and, and do his job and represent them. But up to me, I wouldn't have done that addition. I wouldn't have put a building on here. I said to Paula one day, are you excited about the addition? She said, no. Well, that's okay. You don't have to be excited about it. She's going to have nothing to do with it. I'm thinking about moving her office into it just because of that. <laughs> no, we've got people. We've got people right now. You may not be aware of it, but I am. We've got people that don't come to church here anymore because we put an addition on our building or are putting one on. We still can't walk in there, but you know, if my neighbor put another car onto their garage, I wouldn't move out of the neighborhood and say, I'm not going back to my house anymore. I just wouldn't do that. Somewhere between now and maybe the end of the day or maybe the end of the year, there'll, I believe, be time for every one of us to just do that self-examination in this area too and just say, am I easy to lead? Am I easy to get along with? Am I demanding of my own way? Now, I've got colleagues in ministry. I get to talk to them about stuff like this. And they, they, you know what? I don't like that keyboard they have in that church, and I'm just going to buy another one. So they just buy a keyboard and have it delivered. Nobody knows where it came from just because they don't like the one they had. They don't play it. They don't have, I'm, 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 I'm waiting for somebody to get disgusted with this 7-foot grand who think we ought to have a 16-foot baby grand. Just have it delivered. We'll just say, <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank you. Don't send us a bill because we're not going to pay it, but just... You want to buy us a 16-foot grant? Now, don't take that as a want of mine. <laughs> See, the three pianists that play over here paid me to say that. So, <laughs> See, they're waving hankies right now. Get it, get it. Uh, it's heart check. It's exactly right. It's just a heart check. What am I demanding about? What do I have to have my own way about? And then I read through 1 Corinthians 13 in love. I want you to remember this picture. And, 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 and see, that's the seven churches. And, and then maybe remember this picture. No matter which one it is, he's still in the center. He's still in the center. He's the focus. He, he, he's, he's, the, he's the heart of the whole matter. And when it gets to be what I want, instead of, Lord, what do you want? And how can we glorify you? And how can we lift you up? And, 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 and what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Now, I, I, I didn't finish, so I guess I have to finish because the Lord's got a hold of me here that I didn't finish that... Some folks don't want to come to church here anymore because, quote, we just got out of debt in December and their pastor's putting us back in debt again. Well, I got news for you. You don't have to pay for it. If you don't believe it, just hide and watch. We'll pay for it without you. And the way I can say that, it's not, it's, that's not braggadocious. That's not arrogant at all. I just know, I, I know the Lord that I walk with and I commune with and if he said do it it's his project and not one of his has ever failed ever never you get paid for it just like this previous one we'll use it there'll be children there'll be young people there'll be families there'll be ladies there'll be men there'll be innumerable people blessed their lives will be graced I, I, I took somebody this week and they said so tell me about your daycare he goes to a, a large church, about 5,000 members. He said, we don't have anything like that. He said, you, you think it's valuable? I said, well, all the kids that go through our daycare, 
they don't come from church families. I think we've only got one church family that, that has kids in our daycare, something like that, uh, and, and, and all the rest don't. And I said, these kids come to us like six weeks old and, and, and a year old, two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old before, before they go off into preschool and kindergarten. <clears throat> they don't go to church. They're not, they're not church people. They're not church families. Those kids don't go to church. And every one of those kids learns that Jesus loves them. Every one of those kids learns John 3.16. Every one of those kids learns Bible verses. He stopped and said, can you do that? I said, huh, yeah, we do it every day. Every one of those kids learns all the Bible stories. They learn about Noah and Jonah and Moses. Every one of those kids lear learns, learns Christian songs. Every one of those kids gets up and sings in our Easter program, and we give an altar call at the end. Every one of those kids stands up and sings in our Christmas program. And they sing about Jesus, and they sing about the shepherds and the wise men. Every one of them. Every one of them. Oh, that space will be beautiful. It'll be pretty. It'll be shiny. It'll be new. And then it'll be okay. You know. It's not about what it looks like. It's about what it's used for. What it's used for. And what that's used for will be right here. Not out here. Not out there. I hope this is, 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 is uh, I hope it's eye-opening to you. I hope, I hope it's revealing. I hope, it's, I hope it helps you uh, in, in, in searching your heart. Everything about, everything about Christianity and the encouragements for it in the Bible, it's always about keep Jesus first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Keep him in focus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Consider him who, who keep your eyes on the prize. Forget the things behind and press for the things that are before. It's just a constant encouragement in our Bibles to do that. To do that. And, and you know, if We get rid of that plant. You know, we'll pray over it first. Like, it's plastic. It's not going to die. You know, it's like. You know, we get rid of the trees. Yeah, it's okay. You can clap. You know, it's, 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 I didn't realize how much of a jungle it looked like back there. Like, you know, and we got these beautiful lights that are supposed to change colors, but they, but they just don't work. It's, I don't like that. I know, and I could focus on that. Every day I come in, I could focus on what I don't like about that. Yeah. I could bring my own lights, bless God. <laughs> Hang them up there, blinking, Christmas lights. <laughs> How come we don't have a fog machine? Just, just leave all that stuff. Yeah. If you want a fog machine in your house, this isn't my house. That's not the focus here. Focus here isn't to do what I want. It's how, how, how can I glorify the Lord Jesus Christ? Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your love for us and your goodness for us. Let's have our altar ministry staff come. Thank you for your, your son, our Savior, the focus of it all. Thank you for our redemption through him. Lord, my prayer this morning is that he continue to remain in our personal lives, in our families, in our marriages, in our homes, and in this church. That, Lord Jesus, you remain preeminent always. Be glorified. In your name we've come and gathered. In your name we now dismiss. In Jesus' name.